Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EVA webinar podcast series. We're really pleased today to have Michael Arblaster uh, joining us. Michael is the owner of Harmony Home Energy, which is a, a large HERS Raider. And then we have Billy Giblin. Uh, if you want to ask questions about it, Billy is running for mayor, and today is the day. So wish him <laughs> luck. We hope uh, he's giving an acceptance speech later tonight. And he commented to me this morning, of, why did I pick today to do this? <laughs> but hey, uh, Billy is a quality assurance field specialist with ResNet. So uh, standard webinar rules apply. We've been doing this for a while, but we have a Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Please enter your questions there. I will curate those and ask them to our speakers uh, as they come up. You can chat too. You're going, even if I tell you not to, you're going to chat. So go ahead and put them in the chat or in the Q&A section. Uh, and with that, uh, Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Or Billy, whoever's going first. I tell you what, we'll ease our way into this here a little bit. Um, but thanks, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, um, Michael Arblaster. Um, Billy and I are going to be splitting up uh, these slides as we move along. But I'm just going to sort of ease us into this uh, with the title slide. Uh, we were both sort of doing some work on separate types of presentations and working on some things together. And there was a lot of overlap with some of the pre-drywall um, sort of research and you know consolidation of information over, over the past, I'm gonna say better part of two years, Billy. Um, but we're working this into what would be you know a fuller um, conference type presentation and ResNet is probably gonna be steering that one from what I understand. But today we're gonna be talking about pre-drywall inspections uh, and testing to verify handful of things, optimized framing, air sealing, uh, how to grade insulation, installation, and overall to help uh, prevent callbacks. So I'm just gonna jump forward, um, talk just briefly about me. Um, Aaron, thanks for the intro. I'm Mike Arblaster with Harmony Home Energy. A um, little bit of alphabet soup for me with ResNet and BPI and um, the EPA 608, I have some HVAC background, um, but um, largely got into this the better part of 12 or so years ago, sort of full on drank the Kool-Aid of energy efficiency and had a good, um, you know, you know, family of energy efficiency uh, colleagues over the years that have really made this a, a, a great experience for me. But my background is, like I say, in HVAC, I have some uh, business background and then really went deep into this sustainable systems. Michael, and, uh, do, you turn mind, this... do you mind just telling a little bit more about what the EPA 608 uh, certification so, uh, is? Sure, yeah. So when you do, um, when you get certified to do installation for uh, heat or air conditioning equipment, there's a 608 universal certification that allows you to handle refrigerants. Mm. So that was sort of my background prior to getting into the HERS rating industry. Um, I really, originally pursued building performance institute because of sort of a you know this goes back almost 12 years desire to start working toward electrification um and in seeking out trainings i met the folks at performance systems development and um they uh, got me interested in into the new construction side of things so i spent a good six years working with those folks but uh yeah the 608 really opened the door into this industry because it it you learn everything about you know how air conditioning and heat pumps work. That's great, thank you. Yep. So okay, Billy, I'll jump up for you here. Hi everyone, I'm Billy Giblin. I, I work with ResNet for a lot, since 2018. I'm the quality assurance field specialist for ResNet. Um, I will not be mayor of ResNet. I'm running to be mayor of Nederland, Colorado, where I live. Um, I am a ResNet QAD and, and been a HERS Raider. Uh, since 2011, and, and um, I have a degrees in energy management. That's really the one that got me into this line of work with energy efficiency and um, and renewable energy, and a degree in psychology and forestry from back in back in the olden days. Uh, the the pertinent certifications that are all inactive right now is I work for Resnet. I, I, I don't do any other kind of um, certification work, but I was a lead for Home Screen Raider since. 2012, maybe. Uh, QAD, Lee Fromm's QAD as an NGBS green verifier. 
and a BPI billing analyst. That one was the first one I got in 2010. Um, I'm a father of two kids, a four-year-old and a soon, soon to be nine-year-old. Uh, I was a late bloomer as a dad, but uh, loving having them having them now. They keep me young and keep me mo motivated. I'm still an avid skier, river runner, trail runner. We, uh, our, our family does a lot of those kinds of trips. Uh, in my past lives, I was, did forestry work for years around the near Mountain West, a commercial fisherman in Alaska. And then for 16 years, I was a guide, wilderness guide and river guide and outdoor instructor throughout the primarily throughout the west a little bit of international work and then uh in, in 2000 we wanted to have kids i met my wife we were both guys wanted to have kids had settled down got into the green movement got into energy management and got into this line of work um but we started working with a builder i i, I worked with a builder you know in high school in, in college you know in summers some did hvac installing in the late 90s uh, helping out uh, putting in duct work and I lived up in Winter Park in, in the mountains and then had started doing carpentry kind of full on since 2008 and then got into energy work 2010. So that is that is uh, what I'm up to and uh, glad to be here with you all today. I'm, in, I'm planning to be at the EBA conference here in, in a few weeks in, in Scottsdale. So looking forward to that, but glad we can be here in advance. Um, next slide. So I will, I'm going to, um, so I do live in a small town at 8,000 feet with a, uh, um, not, not the highest speed internet. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off my um, camera video for now just to save some bandwidth. Um, so our learning objectives today are sp talking about specific minimum rated features that can be verified at pre-drywall stages of construction. And we'll talk more about the, you know, the many stages of construction before drywall. Specific, specifically, you know, optimized framing, air sealing, Grade one installation, installation, insulation, installation practices. We're going to talk about benefits of a third party, benefits to the builders of third party inspection and testing, good quality control, lower hurt scores, and reduced callbacks. That's that's a big thing. A lot of this, a lot of what we talk about today, is in, is in is in the effort of, of pointing out that this effort that that hers raters can help in your efforts to reduce your callbacks. Benefits to the raters of more consistent, higher quality ratings, as well as increased inspection revenue streams and requirements. Um, so we'll touch on requirements of pre-draw inspections for several energy efficiency programs. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so but don't don't dwell too much on the uh, all the words. Um, we're just trying to point out that the HERS rater and, and, and RFIs, which are rating field inspectors, are held to uh, th th there are certain core requirements that they need to fulfill to do their work, you know, to be trained, and they're trained and certified and recertified. They have to follow several requirements. We have pretty pretty robust quality assurance to oversee their work, a certain amount of work each year, and this just talks about some, you know, how they have to minimum rated features that they have to verify or test, and how that goes into each rating. And there's a whole quality assurance pro process behind that where quality assurance designees come out and, and, and review their work annually, um, a certain percentage of their work annually, both in the field as well as field, field um, as well as file QA of, of, of ratings that they're submitting. So, um, and we'll touch on, uh, next slide. So again, don't get too caught up in all the words. I was just saying, these are some of the things that they're, they're required. So they do also required to take certain photos. A lot of raters take a lot more than these, but you know, photos that would be specific to pre-drywall would be you know, these nine categories. You know, verifying the address, above grade wall, components, um, insulation, and exterior cavity, exterior, interior insulation, Framing types, you know, taking photos of those foundation walls, attics, attic, and vaulted attic ceiling, vaulted vaulted ceiling, photos of that type of construction, and then um, and ceiling below eighty bad could be another slabs, and then total duct leakage if they take if they do that work pre drywall. So just really what I'm trying to get across is they're re required to take certain photos. Many raters take. Um, and RFIs take a lot more than they're required. And so this gives you another means for them to communicate to you. you go to the next slide as well as uh, an, another way for you to have verification of how things are happening along the way with your homes. Um, 
I just we threw this in here just to give a sense of you know you, you as as a builder you you may be choosing for high performance more optimized framing more advanced framing techniques we we just pulled this this kind of simple or this table out of out of APA's website to um, just talk about maybe switching from 16 on center to 24 on the center going with a single top plate going with going with you know California corners two stud corners uh, minimizing some of your Cost, you know, minimizing cost is a big thing these days with the prices of of, of material, all kinds of materials, including lumbering, fluctuating and tending higher than it, at times than, than they sure have been in the past. Um, so minimizing on extra, extra framing that we don't, don't really need anyways, single headers, uh, right size headers, um, again, minimize, minimizing on studs when we don't need them. Next slide. So that's one thing that the, you know, you, you, you're planning for that. You may be designing for that, but depending on you know the size of your your company as a builder and and, and how much you're able to be out there yourself, you, you you the raider is one who can keep an eye on how the how the trades, the the framers are are, are really how much wood they're putting in there and, and how, how much the, your expected cost with wood is being reflected by what's really being built. So another thing um, that the raiders look at and grade this this happens through our the ANSI standards is there's a ANSI ResNet and ICC go together and create many standards there's one set is 301 that's that's more about the modeling and how, how the homes are homes are how the well how the components go together to create the models to generate her her scores and, and um and um uh, ERIs and different things to meet different codes to meet different things to meet code and then 380 is more the specifics of how they do different types of testing but nonetheless in, in there it's also delineated you know what is these types of grading so grade one is really full continuous contiguous filling all the cavities um well installed insulation up to you know with with no more than two percent gaps uh, in, in the entire you know wall or assembly you know that particular assembly whatever it is wall floor ceiling and grade two can be between two percent and fifteen percent gaps so it's it's definitely a more probably more of what we see in in, in many kind of conditions especially with things like bats or you know, the, the the photos are kind of good because if you see the far left photo is is, is foam insulation the one in the middle is, is more blown in blankets uh, you know the one, or actually the one second from the left is blown to blankets. The one in the middle is is foam, which is generally often a, a good way to go with insulation. But you can see if if they don't, you, if you really look to the left of my thumbs down there, it, to the right of my thumbs down, this you can see light coming right through the foam. So it's so thin in this one spot that it's clearly not even close to give, giving the R value that you're paying for. Um, so we're here to show you that and send you pictures and let you know, hey, this is this is what's happening. Um, Mid construction on your home. Sorry, Billy, I jumped one too far. No worries. And um, so air, air sealing. Um, oh, here I'll take this one. Um, let okay. me see. I sorry I jumped this. I got trigger happy there. No. Okay. Worries. Uh, well, so yeah, and so Billy's talking about this ICC um ANSI ResNet standard 301 that includes an appendix A that includes all of the grading criteria for insulation. And that's great uh, for the HERS rater in the field that's sort of armed with this uh document uh because you can meet the trades folks out there and um, you know, not not always the crews, but when you're meeting like the estimator or or the insulating company owner in the field, you can reference that and be like, there, there are well defined guidelines. Like Billy's saying, this two percent, you know, minor defects we can still call it grade one. Up to fifteen percent we can call it grade two. But the the component is being able to hand that thing over to somebody that standard, and it's these great guidelines that the HERS rater has to train the folks in the field. Um, when you look at air sealing, just to get away from the insulation part of it, um, there are there's specific language in, in code where the uh, IECC you'll see you know air sealing requirements listed. There's a table. Um, uh, there's obviously air sealing requirements in other energy efficiency programs. 
the telltale is usually the blower door test at the end. Um, but getting fine-tuned into the pre-drywall stages is where you correct those problems that later show up as the blower door test. Sometimes it's too late. Um, the point being that you know different areas and assemblies can be verified and, and air sealed at different stages of the construction. Um, and here, you know, pictures on the right are just showing several examples of air barriers behind a, a bathtub, air barrier behind a fireplace. Uh, there's, you know, the fire ceiling. In this case, it's just um, coming through a floor for, for draft stopping. But the same thing takes place at the attic plane. If um, ductwork comes through an attic, that's the upper right picture. And then, you know, these bottom two pictures you see, um, one is just air sealing from the lid. So this is above the, at the attic plane, ceiling at the top plates. And then Billy had a great picture of um, a, a sill seal that was actually used as a gasket to help do uh, air sealing um, at the top plates of the walls with an attic space above. Um, the HERS Raider though does, has the ability to act as this sort of trades relate liaison between the builder and the trade partners. And they're especially good at, especially when you have folks that are very interested in the work that they do and, and are committed to sharing. Um, a lot of the HERS Raiders, it's not that we are policed, but it is nice to know that we are held accountable by ResNet to follow these standards. And our, you know, the work of the HERS Raider uh, is, is reviewed. Um, this moving into the second section, it's like, okay, what are these different stages of construction and, and where are we trying to catch these problems to prevent callbacks? And here's just a, a quick list of things that you don't always think, you think about the pre-drywall inspection sometimes and you just think, oh, this is, the, this is the part where someone comes in, the plumbing's in, the electrical's in, the mechanical's, all this is roughed in um, and we're doing a little air sealing. Now let's hurry up and get the drywall on this thing. Like somebody wants to look, but let's, we just want to get it drywalled at this Point and move along. So it's good to start to, you know, don't think about the pre-drywall as this one afternoon that is the only time that you look at pre-drywall. It, it really is cumulatively things that happen at, at various stages and really starting at the design stage um, where you can start thinking about everything that's happening pre-drywall. Um, and then we're going to just take a look at some of these and think about it sort of through the lens of um, callbacks, but uh, slab, the rough in of the duct, our framing and, you know, aligning the exterior air barrier of the assembly, looking at what's involved with insulation and air barrier inspections as part of a IECC requirement. And then before you do uh, blow in into the attic, you can look at sealing the lid. So this is just a quick example, a um, few slides here to talk about the design stage of construction. And this was just a quick um, sketch that uh, Billy and I were talking about, we put together uh, a day or two ago. But it's this shape that you see is basically the shape of the second story as it sits over the first floor. And the lines represent where we are encountering some different things. In this case, everything that's blue um, is intersecting some type of uh, either framed floor or attic space where there's going to be uh, some misalignment. And you would know a lot of these things from the start that um, misalignments are going to happen. If, if you really break one of these down, um, you can look at every wall section. And here, here's an example of a second story that has two sections that are on both sides green that are exposed to ambient. There's several blue sections here that are a second story walls that are in contact with attic spaces. There's a, an open uh, great room with a vaulted ceiling where that small section, probably actually a railing there, um, but that would be a condition space on the other side of it. And then walls that are have garage on the other side. And by really engaging in this activity, you already know where every place the second story comes out of alignment with the first floor. So a lot of this can be prevented right, right from the first stage of construction. And here we're just showing the ambient attic, you know, garage and um, condition spaces. So here's just another quick slide to show again, um, when you're looking at mechanical and plumbing chases, right on the plans, these chases are already listed. So if you know where to look, here we see uh, an exterior or an interior bathtub. 
um, would it left an open cavity to the attic. This is a second story set of plans. And then again, on an exterior wall, you can see where the a chase is going to be. So it, it's very apparent when you're calling your eye to it at this stage of construction. But when even as simple as looking a little closer, same exact picture, look, here's another little spot. This was, this was just a, a small open corner that we know that there isn't going to be drywall in there. It's going to be an open hole into the attic unless someone gives it attention and adds the drywall. And oh, this is can just you go back for a second. This is this is where I'm. I'm supposed. To, uh, I, I think it's time to insert a um, tasteless joke. Uh, if you're from Utah, you've heard this before. I learned learned it from a builder, and I said it when or for company implementing the Rocky Mountain Power is a. Homes program, but uh, why 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 is the architects? We were just talking about these kind of details where, you know, we we're building something that's just kind of taking up space and not really doing necessarily that much for the home. Uh, why is it the architects end up in hell? Um, because why, why is that, was, Billy? Because Jesus was Jesus was a carpenter. <laughs> Insert awkward laughter. All right, the, the the folks the folks in Utah are nice enough. To laugh at that joke, please. Go ahead. That was that was planned. Uh, okay. what? <laughs> this is an example of what that space looks like in the uh, unplanned by the architect. But you know, when at the beginning, this is the, this are, these are two pictures that were taken. I'm going to say within 30 minutes of one another um, during a, a pre drywall inspection. Notice that this you know cavity we just had some fiberglass stuffed in it. That's not going to that doesn't cut it for the for the air sealing for the blower door test, especially with these tighter envelopes. So uh, one of the drywallers there was nice enough to uh, spare uh, a little piece of drywall and put one screw in it and someone foamed it in. Um, but th these are things that, um, you know, we're catching at the pre-drywall stage. They could have been caught a good while ago. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Billy. Thanks, Mike. Um, so you were just talking through the design and all the things that you, that we can learn about and plan review and, and plan for, for from that point and and know that we're going to be paying attention to different details including air sealing that have to happen with all kinds of construction along the way um and and so one thing the raiders are familiar with because different raiders work with different types of builders there's different as many different types of construction including many types of foundation construction so you see there's a multifamily here on the far left what was built you know the, the, the thermal boundary is the floor above open open parking you know open ambient parking um the the next one is a is a an unvented that one actually was an unvented attic the next one is a slab on grade the next the one in the middle is really showing just kind of the corner coming down on a, a sloped lot where there's we're on, on on the up uphill side it, it's the, the 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 basement is below grade and and then it slopes on down kind of stair steps down and that's a walkout basement the the bottom left one the bottom right one is is a completely below grade uh condition basement and then the top one is a house i i'd gone to in, in Colorado, custom home and Breckenridge, Breck, Breckenridge, and you'd walk right into it on the top, on the back floor, you know, away from where we are here, and uh, walk right into it on the top floor, and then it would kind of stair step down, so you had all kinds of below grade transitioning and, and walk out. This is a walkout basement on the bottom hill side. So, so just the, the the raider, you know, as you the builder understand these different types of construction have to happen to make a home work and and make the different components of a home as you're building into these areas or, or just whatever foundation type you're using. And then the Raiders familiar with the details of, of air sealing and insulating and the different th things that have to happen for those different types of construction and can be there to verify that for you. And, and you know, for sake of a HERS rating, model it correctly. Next slide. Um, so another thing that, you know, just a detail to think about, we, seems very common sense, but right before we start framing on a, on a nice concrete slab that might be sitting out to the elements in the wind and et, et cetera, um, it, during construction, it's just simply cleaning it off. And it, it may be simple, it may be more of a 
more, more of a deal to clean off the slab, but cleaning a slab before sealing and framing, you can see just this photo of a slab that you know is in need of cleaning pre 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 framing, and then the other one was um, the photo to the right is a is a stem wall. It's not so much the the board sitting on the ground, it's kind of just sitting there, but there's a stem wall in the background that again had um, just just debris on it that they started framing on. Mike Mike took this picture and said there was actually just a nail sitting there that had been wedged under the wood, wood but wasn't wasn't cleaned off, wasn't moved, and they just framed on top of it. And so there's this gap that just kind of happens because of a detail of just not cleaning up. So next next, and then and then here. Um, Again, something that can be looked at both in construction, during construction, and then, and then for better and for worse, also, um, um, I can't think of the word, you know, seen at final or later on with a gun, with a, with a thermal camera here, a thermal image, and you see this, the, the expansion joint bulge out a bit and, and made kind of for an imperfection in the seam of the slab and left, you know, therefore just a, a buckle or, or, or kind of a, kind of a, 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 a swerve that didn't doesn't line up with the wall anymore so that then that's a place of leakage and so diagnostics that's what i was trying to think of so so you, you can also the the um radar can come in with tools like a thermal camera and find it later but also possibly see it sooner as they come in earlier in construction and, and deal with that with um sealing it before it's covered up completely next slide I guess. And um, there's value. A lot of times, all the testing is done at final, and 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 there's could be good economic reasons for doing that, or it may just may work in the market, or it may make sense in how you work with your your rater, uh, and also consider that there might be value in looking at doing pre pre what duct testing specifically during during construction. So that could either be pre-insulation when you can really get to the ducts and find the leaks and have no insulation in the way and completely get in and, and, and work on more sealing if needed, duct sealing if needed while you're testing and test it to what you can be working on se actively sealing while you're testing and just bring the number right down until you know the duct is not leaking anymore or otherwise if it doesn't happen before insulation happening while there's insulation where you can still get the things before drywall is up and and, and it's harder to deal with a um, leaky duct system after it's all covered up mike did you want to talk about those two bookend photos a little bit uh, I, I, I yeah sure because sometimes it's hard to note like what we're actually looking at here um so these are both examples of a duct system that's located in an attic and the practice allows the installation practice still allows in Pennsylvania for cavities to be used as returns you can't use them as supplies but um PA had amended that you can still use a cavity wall as a return and and these are just examples of how how um you know poorly it, it can be installed in the the case of the one to the right um there was a equivalent um duct leakage i mean you you, you could, you're trying to tape the system that's in the attic and you want to seal around this um but we had actually tested it to include uh that little bit of framing like so I, I wanted to see how much it was leaking at where the boot intersects the walls and that's it goes the same for both pictures but um cumulatively there was probably uh i think it was it was, it was over 90 between the three of leakage that was getting out of the duct system around the edges of those duct boots before mastic was applied to seal the top of that boot to the top plates and when you think of it at your final blower door test number that leakage into the attic at 90 cfm at the the duct test pressure um is pushing double that amount that'll show up in the blower door test so this is one of these scenarios that getting the duct leakage in check at rough and you're really helping yourself to pass the blower door test um you know later in the construction process so that, that's what i hope to add there thanks really all right 
Hey, I muted. Okay. I was yapping away. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So at the framing stage, um, certain things can happen pre-framing. Certain types of air sealing happen before insulation, most effectively. Some other air sealing needs to happen during or with insulation, and then some is, some air sealing needs to happen later, as we'll talk a bit more. Some some's going to be easier to do and more effective, you know, once once the framing is in there, so you have that other surface to seal against. Um, go ahead. Go, go ahead, but, but it's also before drywall where you can still access things. So um, one thing I wanted to just touch on here is, um, so there's some commonly missed locations of framing, which, which you can see here, and, and we'll get into more next two, two three slides. Um, in this case, you know, we've got things going through the top plates, you know, penetrations, drill holes for electric going through top plates where the, um, um, just where the, the um, vent is coming up through through the, Top plate and it and there's a there's a you know some, something just a bunch of little perforations going right through there and then the you know, window you shoot a little corner so one thing that's nice the main thing I want to point out here is that uh, in this case Mike you know in different, a lot of hers raiders do this they use different tools that are real simple they can do it with phones and they can send they they can take a photo and then draw on it add text to it and just text it to you as a builder or, or send you a report or just do simple text to you and the trade so that you're in communication or the trades or the foreman on the job. And and people can see pretty clearly what the issues are. I mean, to get that photo with those arrows and and and, and some text kind of this, a description helps you really say, oh gosh, you know, I know exactly where to go now and air seal those seams or, or air seal those holes or that part around the window. So it's just, uh, um, that, that kind of communication can really help you as a builder understand what's going on. It's clear and, and easy to share with you and the trades and so that everyone knows what's happening and you can address the issues before you continue construction. Next slide. This is you. Okay. Mike. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just to Billy's point, like I, I know that and just because I'm seeing another example of some notes added um, to a to a photo, but yeah, the ability to somehow like get the photos and, and notes together and shorten the feedback loop of getting that information back to the builder, or maybe they are comfortable or or the raider themselves are comfortable going directly back to the HVAC contractor, back to the back to the insulator, um, and quickly being able to say, hey, I was out there looking around today. I have these handful of photos and notes that I can send you. Um, you know, here's where we missed a few things. And in my experience with that is, you know, obviously there's a, a little bit of um, pushback because no one likes being told, hey, you missed some stuff. But then they also are aware that these are things that they were supposed to be sealing and, th and they're happy to go back and correct it. Maybe not so happy that they may not be paid to go do it because they should have done it on the first trip, uh, which is a whole other kind of a callback. Uh, for the for the trades partner, because they get called back sometimes too. Not as bad as the callback from the homeowner, but um, there there is cost involved to the trades and time involved in having to go back and correct mistakes. And I think that Michael consistently, yeah, go ahead. Do you recommend that we add this to our scope of work for the subcontractor? That because then there isn't that kind of gray area about oh, you know, it's seal all your holes, right? Yeah, that's that's been really good guidance. Like if and if the builder can adopt that, and that there's going to be a lot of this. Aaron, that's a great question. Is I think that it hits the nail on the head of where I feel like the conversation's been going. Um, I'm going to say recently, inside of the last two years, but it's it's been more on that fill your own fill your own uh, whole approach, mm -hmm. and also it's that. There, there's these handoffs. I'm sure you guys have talked about this in the past, but if no one's ever sort of picked up on this, as the codes evolve and as the home needs to be more airtight, um, there are gaps between who did the work and who's accountable for taking care of it. And even if the HERS Raider can work on a few houses, put that into a list. And this is what I've done with, because it, it's there's no silver bullet. Every builder has practices that are slightly different, different trades crews, everybody does things differently. But 
from a Herzberg perspective, that we get it. Like there's a million different ways to do this a right way. Um, let's find out where something is slipping through the cracks, put that into a list, and it needs to be assigned to somebody. Yeah. Um, and if that is, I feel like that's the answer to the question, Aaron. Great. Thank you. Um, this is exactly it. Whose job is it to make sure we consistently catch these small, but, you know, possibly cumulatively significant problems. This is a, a wire going through a, um, a electrical box at an attic plane. And there are three of them. You start adding up this whole times three times 10 times 15 boxes. And it's a small home that has to be under three air changes. I've had homes that went from over five to I want one recently. We were at right around five small home, 1500 square feet, just by getting all of the electrical penetrations uh, brought it down an air change and a half just on electrical boxes. So they these small things add up on the air sealing side of things, but um, they're you know small cumulative, long, thin, and discrete lines. Like if you take, uh, this is a, on the far right, there's a picture of a little bit of daylight coming in around exterior uh, polyisis annurate. Um, just happened to be able to notice it here. It was just enough that you could see the daylight, but this this gap exists on all, you know, I, it's called 160 linear feet at the bottom, another 160 at the top, times that by a 64th of an inch, you start to get a pretty big hole. Um, this is a another just example of um, sort of things to look for that may or may not get caught, uh, that there's no silver bullet out there for these things. But it, at first glance, you see a bunch of framing and you see where someone uh, near the top had applied uh, a, a spray on drywall gasket foam. But what was missed is that they had to frame a two by six wall under there to make room for some of the for a vent pipe that was going into the attic and it you know it leaves a two inch space that the drywall is going to be held off of this um this so literally the insulation would fall you know like directly down uh, around these holes um th these are some of the valuable things that uh preventing callbacks this getting caught at this stage of construction and not having someone be in the laundry room uh, the first winter or summer and whatnot, like what is going on in here? Like freezing, like it's really drafty, like it uh, but easily could have been caught, um, you know, at, at pre-drywall stage. One thing that's um, good to point out is like this insulation and air barrier inspection stage, this, this is part of IECC. It's been an option in, since the 2009 and beyond. There's a, a table that you can reference in code. Um, that sort of lays out all of these different criteria for and instructions on the proper installation of insulation, and it, and it has um, details on where where the air sealing should take place. So it's it's just important to note that this is available really, you know, to anyone. It's it's right in the code, and um, I just want to point it out. It's just a really well organized list. I find it super valuable because. It gives you these categories to sort of when you're out um, doing pre-drywall work, and maybe you want to aggregate it yourself. You know, keep keep tabs on each builder. Like, well, you guys consistently have a problem with you know, these wire penetrations. You consistently, you know, have something where you, you don't put blocking, you know, over uh, the bathtub chases or things like that. Um, and here's an example of you know, like sealing at the lid. Same thing. Like maybe, you know, as part of that. Um, inspection, you can continue to point out that, hey, we're using that drywall gasket, but as you can see in this top right corner with the tape measure, this is where the drywall gasket was used, but it doesn't actually seal everywhere. And on, on the right too, you can see that after that gasket's installed, it's still leaving pretty significant voids um, for air cavities into the house where um, maybe another way Billy shows you're not going to be able to do this with bat insulation at the attic plane, but you should do something there. And maybe that something is to use a like a sill sill material uh, to provide that gasket. And this would be just a different, again, another stage of construction, um, sort of last chance before the blown in insulation um, goes in. So I'll take these uh, just next two slides to talk about 
summarizing, you know, where, where we're going with all those hey, pictures. Can I, and, just, can I just mention one quick thing? Um, sure. Going back to that, uh, you know, I know when people st first started using this in Utah um, with the, the sill seal going around, I think it was when there you start with switching versions up to three and um, the, the 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 piece with like getting trades on the same page was t then teaching the drywaller that you know it wasn't it was important to keep those in place when, when they moved the drywall versus just sliding drywall up the wall and ripping it out and then just because it started bunching up and they would just rip it out and there'd be piles of it on the ground to like it have to be kind of lifted and, and slid above the sill seal so it actually you know didn't just destroy the potential for that to be to be a um an air seal at, the, at that air in that area and it was just really about educating and coordinating the different trades to get to help them better understand what what the previous step was all about so next go go ahead yeah and that's when we're thinking of summarizing i think like billy what you're saying like we're this quality control these are opportunities to uh, sort of align the trades um if you're a builder you're working with hers raiders and they're already um it it's not um in, you know in my opinion sort of not giving them any authority out there over the over the trades guys but just if if they haven't had the opportunity to sort of have that handshake with with the different trades folks and i feel like like most probably have but it's good to make that connection and sort of open that um, communication path so that the raiders can share this information um, with the trade partners. Um, and Aaron, it comes back to that too, like, hey, whose job is this? Um, we can have that conversation out there and, you know, get everybody aligned. I, I had a really great meeting where we got uh, the builder owner, uh, myself, we had the HVAC guy, insulator, and the drywaller and we just had a quick meeting to talk about hey this we're tightening the houses up a little more there's these handful of things that we think are slipping through the cracks that was my that was my pun joke for the day that's it though boom. um yep boom <laughs> yep there's there's more there's more than that it's a warm-up i was going uh so but it was so valuable and it just let everybody know we're on the same page and i, I remember it was such excitement of, we got the agreement from the builder that we're going to start just using blocking we're just putting two by blocking every place that there's a, a floor above a uh, first floor just put blocking under there we can drill holes and through it afterwards if we have to run plumbing or whatnot and i'm so excited and i'm looking at the the insulator and i was like did that just happen and he's like what and i'm like all of it and i was like this it's gonna be so easy to air seal this place now um and, and it has been and it was just this one conversation with everybody there to sort of feel out like hey who thinks they can take care of this missing piece and you know once we were all on the same page it's been really great uh following that so um the one thing with with this inspection process and if it's not for raiders thinking about it there's a, there's a huge value in having consistency in the inspection process. Like, um, I, I would, you know, explain it this way, like with builder partners, I've gone in and said, look, there are several different levels of scrutiny that I can apply to these buildings. <laughs> you know, So um, what level of that do you want? Like what, what level of nitpicking would you like to see? And whatever that level of nitpicking is, stick to it. You can't go in and you know only catch the big things sometimes, and then later go back and show every place that a board didn't you know, completely, you know, push against the, the the neighboring stud, and you know, didn't leave a noticeable air space. But I still think air can get through there at, at an atomic level. I believe that air can still get through this space, so I would like that corrected. Um, just be consistent because when the message is consistent and they know what are the big problems and that these are need to be addressed you build sort of this confidence with the with the trades folks or uh, um validity with the with the trades personnel and and on top of that too it's the shortening of the feedback loop time um i i like the idea of being able to take the pictures get notes attached to them get that reported back immediately like while i'm still on site to give the most amount of time for the the builder to forward that to the trade person to come back and correct it if needed or point out that this needs corrected, but guess what? You can still reach it after drywall. So important, but not 
important and time sensitive type approach. Um, it does. Seem, it goes, does seem like th- that approach is it's it's creating the relationship and 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 mo- building collaboration. And and if if you're able to as a builder build more collaboration amongst your different trades, it just it smooths, smooths up the whole process. And, and and these details often you know. D- continue in the way you want them to throughout the whole pro- throughout the whole construction of the home. Absolutely. And, and so from the, just the documentation perspective, we're looking at, you know, raters, you need to n- know that the timely reporting of this information is is what's of the value to the builder. You know, don't wait till the end and be like, oh, I could have told you that that wasn't sealed. Uh, well, tell right away. And then on the builders know that, um, these raters, like Billy said, often take way more pictures than what is required by minimum rated features and really can be valuable in helping solve those problems down the road, especially if they do have prior notes and photos from you know, potential potential issues. So huge quality control opportunities. Um, this is just a quick example of some reporting. I had done recently a, a multi-family building. It was just one building, uh, 36 units. Uh, between all, all of the units, um, there was total, some of them ended up moving into a pass category, but I identified issues and this is all this is using is the, the general requirements that are part of the code, um, insulation and air barrier, um, inspection checklist, and just sort of made notes of every place that I took a picture that was some deficiency or maybe something that didn't align with the plans. And it's great to look at something like that later and be like, well, clearly there's a problem with what they're doing with the rim joists. Um, handful of plumbing and wiring misses, but not terrible. Um, handful of little things sealing an attic. This is actually on a deeper dive. It was two particular unit types had the same problem. So really this was just something identified for two of the like styles of the floor plan had a problem. And then others were just um, general, um, more general requirements that, um, would be a drill down, but uh, there's there's you know great information that can come out of the, of the re- reporting of this, especially if you want to try to aggregate it together a little bit. Um, I think this will be my last slide. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about pre drywall um, and sort of like the compliance and the certification pathway because um, when you start going back to code, the whole back to the 2009 and think about what's required to achieve these greater certifications that they're they're stacked on one another so i mean you 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 really can't go down like a hers uh energy rating index compliance path if you're not meeting some other basic code requirements as well and you can't move forward into energy star certification if the home hasn't been hers rated so to just move down that quickly um you know there is there are requirements in the 2009 that someone should be doing the insulation installation correctly, but it's not until you get to the HERS rating that a third party who is held accountable for doing their third party work is doing that part of the job. And then when you move into the Energy Star certification, which I don't know if anybody caught the news, but this is going to be kind of a big deal here pretty soon. Um, we'll talk about that too. But um, now there's additional um, inspection criteria and it gets it gets more so as you move down the line, but it, it really all starts with a lot of this work that's happening pre drywall. And there's so many more benefits that come from reducing callbacks, you know, just as there are now new incentives on achieving the certification. So that's I think all I would like to say about that. Michael, we had a question that came in. Um, sure. I'm wondering if this slide's an appropriate place to talk about it, but it's a question on how does Pearl compare to these different rating systems that you have up. You know, so Billy, that might be one for actually for you to feel because okay. we talked about pulling in several uh, other programs. Per, Pearl, um, yeah, yeah, and we we just kind of went with some of the uh, oh ICC, ERS, EPA, DOE, and then FIAS. We didn't touch on LEED or NGBS or Enterprise Green, but Pearl, if I'm not mistaken, is more of a existing homes. Um, and the reality, hers, the hers index was d- designed to apply to either, ex- you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's correct about Pearl. And, and um, 
the, the HERS index was designed to be applied to an existing home or a new home. It is definitely morphed into being primarily almost totally new homes and, and, and that has become its niche, but it was definitely, it, it was, it was created to also apply to existing homes. And so there's not too many, so that's where, I mean, actually for a HERS rating, you don't have to do a pre-drywall instruction or inspection or anything pre-drywall uh, to, to get a HERS rating because in the case of an existing home, that's kind of not really possible and, and, and existing or um, a, a, you know, so, some of the stuff, you can't see a home mid construction because it's already done. So the Pearl certification, and I apologize, I'm not as familiar with it as I ought to be, but it's really looking at things and again, correct me if I'm wrong out there, um, yeah. that are more I, based on an existing home uh, yeah. and you know, where it's at today. When you're yeah, at I, I do know that Pearl is, I just saw a presentation last month that Pearl is coming out with a new home program as well. Oh. And I believe for our audience that we have a webinar coming up with them in the next two months. Cool. So watch for that and uh, more details to come on where this new program falls in. But I know particularly in the Southeastern United States, Pearl is qu quite large and growing and they're looking to expand. So that's my two cents. Thank you. It would be a great one to work in. I mean, following this just to see where it lands because yeah. in, uh, you know, from here in Pennsylvania that we don't, aren't really seeing much of it yet. But um, I know through through my providership, they've recently started talking to me about it. So, yeah, the, the, these one these five that you show here, and I think Pearl's the same. They they really apply to the building. I think that's where these make sense as being in the group. You know, Lead and GBS and Enterprise Green. They start to take into account. They definitely look at the building, but they often use one of these paths to evaluate the building, and then and then they they're looking at the site selection and and, and the location and, and all these other elements of a home that, that aren't just buildings. So, um, Pearl, I do think, is primarily focused on the building, too. Uh, again, I could be wrong. Great, thank you. Don't be ahead there, Billy. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from here. We've got a few more slides, and we'll be ready for a couple questions. Um, a few mm -hmm. more questions. Per performance path is the most flexible way to meet code compliance. So depending on where you are, there are several ways to meet code. The nice thing about any, either, you know, the performance path options is that you can do some trade-offs. You may not be able to, you know, there will likely be some kind of backstops or minimums or things that you have to do, but often there's a, there, there's, there's a path and options for you to choose to, to go a little higher with something else and, and 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 go a little lower with something else, but still end up where you need to be for code compliance. Um, more, um, and, and so the, the this inspection can play into that, given whatever path you're using to meet code. You know, all, all these inspections and, and verifications and testing we've been talking about. Um, with with seeing the house more often, you're going to be more accurate in the modeling and have more consistent in your verification process and go for lower HER scores. If, if, which is, you know, as you likely know, a lower horse score is better. So improved uh, her score. Um, grading of insulation, it, this one's a little done. That, um, if you don't see the home, it, that's what I was trying to get to here. If you don't see the home at um, pre-drywall, then you have to default it into a grade three. Now, there are, are, there are a couple ter wor uh, workarounds now where it can be grade two, and I guess maybe even grade one with like certain thermal imaging, if you have the right kind of credential and or another, uh, a, 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 a prof another professional like signing off on it. Um, but in general, if the home isn't seen at grade one, it, all the all the insulation is graded, all the insulation that can't be verified at final is, is graded grade three, which really does, um, it's hard on, it really brings up the HERS score. It really, really, you know, works against you. And in the case of Energy Star, you can't earn that certification with a grade three. You have to have a grade one or two, but you can't um, get the certification with grade three. Um, and then, yeah, really for the best, be, best way to get your best air sealing inspections along the way is to see things as they're going in versus trying to figure it out once they're covered up. 
Um, so that just th these these kinds of inspections and testing really help with code compliance. Go, next slide. Um, so just want to touch on um, Mike just hinted at it, but if you you likely and if you don't know uh, whether you do or not that the the new Infl inflation reduction act that was passed and and signed into law recently extended amended improved and extended um kind of solidified the 45 45l tax credit for a while and so that has increased the tax credit up to 25 2500 dollars per home if it meets um energy star single family new homes program standards so if it's uh so the home your homes each each home can get a 2500 dollar tax credit if you meet energy star um let me just put some little shots here of, of their thermal their their radar checklist which is kind of a more detailed way that energy state star lays out what they're looking for um, in, in mid construction inspections next slide and then a five thousand dollar tax credit for homes certified to meet doe's zero energy ready home program so if you're if you if you pay attention to eba you you know if you come to conference you know you you've definitely um hopefully been been exposed to the zero energy ready home program sam raskin definitely has championed it changed the name from it used to be challenge home and, and really evolved it into the zero energy ready home program and um and now and, and and now that the home built to that and certified to that standard to that um gets a five thousand dollar tax credit per home. next and slide billy billy those aren't um combined you either Get the twenty five hundred dollar level, or you reach the five thousand. Thank you. Yeah, and, and yeah, good point. And they are not. And and also, I guess to clarify, part of that is a zero energy ready home also has to have been certified Energy Star. It's kind of one of the building blocks. Like when right. from Mike's thing back before, they're all kind of building blocks. Zero energy ready home, you you would be required to pass Energy Star. And with a passive house home, you'd be required to. Energy Star and Zero Energy Ready Homes, they build on each other. But you're right, it's it's an either or for the tax. Yeah, thank you. No, definitely exciting stuff with the new IRA, right? It is, it is. Next slide, Mike. Yeah. Um, so this is our last slide for the questions. But so in conclusion, um, the, the value that, that we see of a free drywall, um, you, know, you know, inspection or inspections, and how they can help you as a builder is reducing callbacks through independent first rate or third party first rate or services, improving consistency and how your homes are built. You know, a lot of it's collaboration and working with your trades to just get better. It's continual improvement and improve consistency over time due to, you know, agreeing to what, you know, define inspection standards that a HERS rater brings to the table, plus you working with your HERS rater to let them know really what, what you want and keep things consistent in your homes. Incremental improvement, again, just continual improvement driven by rater feedback and trades training and, and just collaboration. Improved quality and comfort driven by the, the third party independent accountable accountable through the resident system an independent third party who can help you deliver you know higher quality and more comfortable homes next slide this is it thanks a bunch everybody um this is our contact info and we are open for questions yeah one of the questions uh that came up was i think you know it's good advice of doing an additional pre-drywall inspection. And Michael, I kind of like what you were talking about, about why not have the energy rater there with you on the plan review side? Uh, and I don't want you to say a dollar amount, but perhaps you can say a percentage that we might pay based on a standard HERS rater uh, to add those additional services. Do you have a, a feel for that? I I do. Um, and, I, and I tell you what, like, just like as the plan review is a piece, there are folks that can do the HERS ratings without having to do the pre drywall work. Um, I, I like that it's sort of like, hey, just do the whole package, um, you know, and let, let me consistently go and do this. But I really feel like the, the plan, plan review stage and being able to do um, and the reporting can be 
you know, upwards of 20, 25% of the total, total uh, cost that goes into the, the rating process, my, my opinion. Yeah, the only thing I'd say is it, 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 it um, I think the demand for that will vary around the country with different markets. Some markets are much more competitive you just, I get to see markets around the country. Some might markets are more competitive and price point driven, you know, um, and, and others um, are, you know, the, the price is much higher for hers rating and, there, and there's a different value set or just a different market. And so I think, uh, you know, I'd say a lot of the builders were focused in on EBA and high performance homes tend to see the value of things that will help, help, help them in their quest to build better homes and also you know and give them assurance that things are happening the way they intend for them to happen uh but but the market sometimes can drive uh that third or even fourth visit to a home um so i just want to put that out there great um uh, i love what you're talking about on the new ira what are the additional things in the IRA that you think are going to be beneficial to home builders? I, I know there's some things on rebates for heat yeah. pump products generally, but what's your take, your early take, Billy? I, you know, I'm just getting my head wrapped around things, but it would seem like renewables, solar, um, some EV charging, um, yeah. definitely the heat pump looks, looks significant. Some, um, some uh, battery benefits to electrification, electrification. Uh, um, incentives for electrification. Mm, yeah. Some high level things that I see that are how I just sat and talked with a guy on solar. Um, see, on Saturday, he was up here talking about the tax credit available now. Um, so, so I think those are some of the things that, that. Yeah, I think my solar guy told me that Anything installed in 2022 will now qualify for a 30% rebate yes. instead mm -hmm. of a 26, which is, you know, if you were so lucky as to put it in this year, you would get a 30% rebate. But there's a lot of rebate money there. I think that's a big thing when builders come into EBO that we always talk about the 45L tax credit. And if you're, you might be doing good enough work to get this done, but you really want that HERS energy rater on your team because they're going to help you through the compliance portions of that. Yeah. I mean, they, they will arguably pay for themselves with, with these new, new, new tax credits because, because they can make you eligible for those. And then um, I think that the, the EV, I'm just learning this, but the EV, I guess some of those tax, the electric vehicle um, compatibility or electric, electric vehicle ready homes, and I'm not sure exactly what level you have to do, but if you're putting in an EV charging into a new home, I, I think it's, there's so, a certain percentage for putting it in, but if you do all, all made in the USA products, it goes pretty high, like 40% or something. So it's, yeah, they're trying to incentivize, you know, products in the US. Yeah. And I think Aaron too, like Billy, I just to tag onto, onto that with, so when you're looking at these, you know, the different, the, you know, the percentages and what, what pieces you can get on individual components. I think what's really exceptional right now is that, you know, the first thought that came to my mind, like the knee jerk reaction was, is like, oh my gosh, this is for 10 years. So I should be able to find at the state level, how long those state level incentive programs for new construction are still in place and sort of start looking at this as an overlay of this compounding incentive. Right. Um, because now with a 10 year window, you used to have to sort of like, oh, hey guys, I come in, I'm talking to the builder, you're in a plan, you're halfway built out. Hey, this great new thing came along, let's start doing Energy Star. Well, I don't really wanna compete with myself. So I don't wanna start pushing half of this plan into Energy Star and all electric when the first half of the plan is not and is all, you know, gas hot water or something so i can't start switching everybody over to heat pump water heaters all the other people are going to want to know why they don't have one but it, it does finally give an opportunity for the builder to sort of test the waters on the way out of a development before they begin the next community and really start to think longer term about can we can we pull this off yeah. and get, get all of the incentives for all, uh, at the utility incentive the tax incentive to get the incentive on the reduced cost of the equipment 
mm-hmm. and really see where, how that can compound into a real a real home run. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Oh, that's great. Uh, one question we had come up, and I'll toss it out to both of you is, can you speak to the value of sound transmission control rating improvements that would be concurrent with air infiltration and attention to detail there? I mean, Billy, I never stop thinking about this. I don't know about you. <laughs> it, it's well, sort of tongue in cheek, but it's the fact. I, I happen yeah. to live in a place where um, my existing home is an earshot of an interstate. Yeah. And I've done a significant amount of research on sound attenuation right down to like what are the frequency ranges that bounce around in this house and why are they can it, at times, you know, oh, because they're at a frequency, the same matching frequency range that they use for sirens and fire alarms. That's why this is uneasy sometimes. Uh, it's right down to the frequency range. So I don't have 100% what the answers are, but I can tell you that the air sealing and adequacy of the, if the air and the light can get through, the sound gets through. So mm-hmm. beyond like the um, sound attenuation rating of the window, the glazing itself, um, stopping, you know, improving the, the air sealing of the home absolutely has an impact. I, I wish I could tell you, I really wish I could tell you at down to the decibel <laughs> what, what yeah. impact this makes. But I, I know that it's a huge improvement. And I, I know that's not as detailed as we might like, but um, if there is any research on that, I'd love to learn more. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I don't, okay. I don't, have, any, I don't have any specifics, but yeah, I, 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 I um, uh, yeah, I do know that obviously things like insulation, et cetera, can, can drive down the sound, but, 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 you know, when it comes into real, you know, it seems like they would be um, correlated, but, but I think there's, I don't know that much about it and things would have to be specific, I guess, for, um, sure. for bring, yeah. us, bring it down even more. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, Michael R. Blaster with Harmony Home Energy and Billy Giblin with ResNet for joining us today. I, it was a fantastic presentation. I, I loved uh, all the call-outs that you did and some of the new ideas that you brought. This uh, will be recorded and available on uh, www.eba.org. And I think if it's okay with you, Michael and Billy, we'll get a copy of the presentation. A lot of folks asked for, you know, could we get a PDF copy of it for later? So sure. we'll we'll post that there if that's all right with you. Yeah, we'll send it to Nancy. Fantastic. All right, well, have a great day. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody, appreciate your time. Hope we see a bunch of you at the EBA. Summit in the Scottsdale.